Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Monday Sunday follow up, and we're glad you've chosen to join us tonight. I'm Aaron, and this is my beautiful wife, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that funny? That's my name. And we're glad you're here with us. Yes. We have more fun doing these than you should have. <laughs> So we just take a moment on Monday and follow up with questions that you have sent us about the Sunday sermon, and we've got a lot of a them lot, tonight. Yeah. Many of them came from our youth, uh, and so we've got a lot of questions tonight. What are we talking about Sunday? Well, um, I was awake for most of it, um, and what we talked about... You've not been ejected from the video yet this year. It's about <laughs> to happen. Um, what we talked about was a passage from Mark um, where... Jesus casts the demon called Legion because there were many. It was an army of demons in this poor possessed man. And Jesus casts the demons out. So we, we talked about demons and most of our questions come from that topic. Yeah. Um, when, whenever you talk about like the supernatural and the demonic and especially around Halloween, which I didn't really sure, put that yeah. together until just now, but you always have a lot of questions. And... And you should, because there's a lot of unknown out there and a lot of, there's a lot more Hollywood in our demonic theology, if you will, than, than what's biblical. So it's, it's, it's a good time to cover some of this. So you mean like the head spinning around kind of Hollywood? Yeah, the, yeah. yeah heads don't spin around. I mean, oh, okay. people can do what you and I would consider marvelous and supernatural stuff, but their heads, like... Not so much. The laws of physics suddenly don't break. Like, gotcha. What is, is it, the Exorcist movie where the grandma was climbing on the ceiling? I just remember watching it as a kid, and it may be like Exorcist 3 or something, yeah. but I remember we were watching it as a kid, and the whole room's terrified. And this grandma's supposed to be crawling on the ceiling, and I am dying laughing because I just thought it was funny. And I'm like, oh, there's a grandma crawling on the ceiling. <laughs> kind of ruined the suspense for everybody else, but I just thought it was the funniest thing. I'm not a good guy to watch scary movies with. No, me neither, because I scream. Yeah. I okay. laugh, you scream. So, so um, back to business. Pastor, why do demons attack us? That was one of our questions. Why do they attack us? Why? That's not funny <laughs> That's either. A, well, you're not going in order. You threw me off there with oh, like well. a curveball. Why do demons attack us? Um, <clears throat> well, because we're God's children. And remember, the demons became demons because they rebelled uh, in, in heaven against God. In that sense, the demons are still at war. And as C.S. Lewis says, that uh, their greatest desire is to steal our heart from God and to eat our soul in the sense of it, to destroy it. And so they can't beat God, but what they can do is harm what is most precious to God, which is you and I. Uh, and so since the fall, uh, Again, I just love the, the language of, of Lewis from Narnia, but the, the sons of Adam and, and the daughters of Eve have been at war against the evil forces of Satan. Why didn't God just get rid of all the demons? Yeah, the, the, why didn't God get rid of all the demons is really a question that about, like, why does evil exist at all? Or why does God continue to allow evil? And part of that is because of free will. In the sense of, for God to eradicate all evil would mean that you and I get eradicated too. Because let's face it, none of us are good. And so what we want is we want a, to God to create this kind of utopia world where evil doesn't exist unless you and I want to do it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and again, it's just not the way the perfect judgment of God works or the perfect righteousness of God works. There'll be a day when uh, evil no longer exists, but and it's quarantined, if you will. It, it'll exist, I guess I should say, but it's, it's quarantined to hell. Yeah. And so in heaven, there'll be no more evil because it'll all be quarantined out of heaven. Uh, but evil exists because God, again, in his righteous judgment, doesn't annihilate or destroy all evil. Um, so this next question, I'm going to guess, is from a youth and okay. not from you. Um, my mom lets me watch scary movies about demons. I thought it's you wrote this question. question. I thought it was from you. Should I be afraid of demons? Yeah. Um, again, this is a, a big question around Halloween with a lot of our teenagers and stuff. But um, and this is where you, you can you see a lot of stuff in Hollywood that isn't 
quite accurate or quite true. And yet the reality of it is, is Hollywood, if we could see the supernatural, cannot manufacture a movie or produce a movie that is as scary as it as the supernatural world really is. Um, so we, we see the Freddy Cougars, the Jasons, and uh, you know, whatever the movies are. I'm not really in touch with the scary movies. Um, I'm much more of a Monty Python type guy. But, uh, what, what we have to remember is this. Um, demonic forces are real, but we don't need to live in fear of Satan. Again, Jesus says there's only one person you should fear, and that's, that's basically God. The beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And so we don't need to fear Satan, but we need to respect that there are forces out there that are not friendly, that are hostile, that we live in a hostile area. And so we got to be careful. This is why I say to our youth a lot, like, and I know there's a lot of your friends who like to mess around with the Ouija board, but you're opening a door to spiritual forces when you start asking something else questions about the future or, or about the supernatural world. And, and you never know what's going to happen when you open a spiritual door to a demonic influence. You want to add anything to that? Um, yes, I uh, can personally attest to a very frightening um, experience with a Ouija board. Um, I was in high school and my mom and I were using the Ouija board and I was, um, I used to collect memorabilia from an actress, Natalie Wood, and I was trying to communicate with Natalie Wood and I was asking questions only Natalie would know the answer to. And it was moving, it was just my mom and me and I wasn't moving it, I assumed she was. But it was kind of like this spirit or whatever had like a sarcastic vibe. And so I said, can you read my mind? And it spelled yes, or it went to yes. And I said, okay, what am I thinking right now? And I was thinking the words, you suck. I was a teenager, whatever. And I kid you not, it moved and spelled out each letter, you suck. And I just started bawling because I thought, first of all, I believe only God can truly read my mind. Um, I don't believe demons can do that. And, and if that's not true, please don't tell me because I'll be freaked out. But I thought you have no recourse if something can read your mind. It knows what you're going to do before you even do it. Because as soon as you have the thought, your mind has been read. So, I mean, it was terrifying. And, you know, I I've, have other friends that have had similar really frightening experiences and I think when you do open up your mind to that possibility and that realm when that door opens a little bit those evil forces are going to push their way in um, because we are in spiritual warfare there's no question about it and um, those forces are always looking for some sort of portal or opening in, into your mind and heart and thoughts. And that, that definitely was an experience I had that night. Yeah. And I, again, it's, I mean, I use this with youth a lot, but you know, we're told don't do something or don't participate in something because it's not fun or it doesn't really work. But the reality of it is you are tapping into the potential of a, of a spiritual force that again, is not friendly. It's not from God. And so it, it might work right at least temporarily the the irony is is that you're going to a tool of satan to try to learn something when satan cannot manufacture the future he cannot impact the future in the sense he doesn't control it and he certainly when, couldn't trust anything right he, he wants says. to destroy you right he's with, a liar right i mean again back to the, the sunday message when jesus casts the demons out they want to go into pigs and what do they do to the pigs so they've hurt the man he lives in the tombs they go to the pigs and the pigs run off the cliff uh, so the demons are not your friend no matter what they claim and and in that moment we have the power to tap into the one who controls the future we don't ever need to go to something like the Ouija board or the horoscope to say, hey, what's my day going to be? What's my future going to be? We have the God Almighty who says, I've got this and I've got you and I have the whole world in my hands. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still kind of skipping around. Um, do ghosts exist? 
Mm. And if so, is there a difference between ghosts and demons? Yeah, this one's a really good question. A little tricky because, first of all, we'd have to stop and say, all right, what do you mean by ghost? Because, uh, you know, does that Casper? Like that. Yep, that's exactly what they were thinking. Let's move on now. <laughs> yeah, Did I we scare you? <clears throat> uh, my heart's beating like, incredibly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so are we talking about Casper or are we talking about, um, like, again, like for grandma. kind of... Grandma. Grandma here with Yeah, so we got, or... we got, you know, Grandma who passed away and she still hangs out in the house. Or are we talking we go about... go to Alcatraz and there's all the ghosts supposedly right. still inhabiting right. Alcatraz. And then there's, the, again, when we talk ghosts, there's people who think, like, Freddy Cougar and weird things that are out to kill you. So, uh, you know, the the spaghetti monster that's out in the barn, you know. The dead who are not at rest. They're not yeah, at so, peace. They can't go on. So that would be the traditional view of a ghost, that it's someone who's passed away, that for whatever reason, their soul has not made it to wherever it's going. Uh, I'm not a big believer in this. Now, I've obviously not been dead, so I can't speak with authority Yet. on this. Um, great. Now everyone will know who does it when Shoot. it happens. Have it on video, dear. Uh, so I'm, I, I hesitate to speak with authority and say, hey, ghosts don't exist in the sense of there aren't souls that are taking longer to get to wherever they want to go. But that just seems strange to me. Um I'm a bigger believer in the fact that there are demons who love to play tricks on our minds. And, um, again, often we, we hear someone dying a, a violent death. And when you trace back kind of who they were, suddenly you start to go, you know, this person really didn't have a relationship with Jesus, but seemed like they were dabbling in some weird worldview stuff. And so, again, what they've done is they've already opened up some demonic influences, maybe around the house or around uh, a family. And, and what we have then is this this demon that I think loves to play tricks on our minds. So I'm not a big believer in ghosts, but I'm not going to speak with authority uh, as one who knows all things. That's not me uh, saying that ghosts don't exist, but I, I'm a big believer in demons who would love to mess with our minds and who would love to convince us that A, they're much more powerful than they are, uh, or on the other side, that, that they're not really around when they actually are around. Um, so do ghosts exist? I, I'm not buying that one so much. Uh, do demons love to mess with our mind? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have some thoughts on this. I used to watch, um, his name was John Edwards, and it was someone who, you know, supposedly was speaking to your dead loved ones, and he would go and, like, arenas. You did arenas. a lot of weird things when you were a kid. I'm telling you. Or was this last week? Last month. He would go, He would basically speak to arenas, and he would say, you know, I'm getting, like, over here, somebody, something with Wrigley Field and whoever, oh, you know, my great aunt, whatever. Um, and I, it was fascinating because he really seemed to be connecting with these people's late loved ones. And I don't believe he was intentionally defrauding, frauding. Well, I don't know what the word is. I don't believe he was intentionally trying to deceive. Exactly. Um, but I did, watching it as a Christian, think several things. First of all, when we lose someone, we're so desperate to know that they're okay. And we want to hear that. And that's what he said over and over again. She's fine. She's fine. She's fine. And they, you could just see the oh, feeling in these people. Um, but when you just believe, well, when everybody dies, they're fine it kind of negates what the scripture tells us. I was going to say, I was going to ask you, did he ever say like, hey, I'm sorry, yeah, not Joe so is fine. burning in hell. <laughs> Never, not once. And so I thought demons, like you said, have been here forever. They've seen our daily lives. They've seen these, these people who have died, how they live their lives, and they know that they went to Wrigley Field. And they can say that and... And, you know, masquerade as this person that's lost, uh, that was lost, and um, and lead people to believe that everybody just goes to heaven and everybody's fine. And it's just another tool of deception, I think, because we want to believe that. Yeah, and it's interesting because you bring up a bigger issue rather than demons. Because, again, this is 
I think as Christians, this isn't where we should focus most of our time, even though this entire video is ultimately about that. But you bring up the better point, which is, hey, rather than all, all people go to heaven, the real case that we should be making is the way to get to heaven is Jesus. And so at the end of the day, <clears throat> again, Jesus defeated the power of Satan on the cross. And the power of Satan was death, the separation from God. And Jesus came and said that I, I've come that you may have life and life everlasting. So the power of Satan was death through sin. Jesus defeated the power of death through his death and resurrection upon the cross. And now eternal life is available to us. So again, I don't like to focus on Satan so much because, first of all, why would I want to focus on the losing team? There's not much I can learn there. <laughs> You're um, way too competitive for that. Right. When I have access to the holy throne of God through the Holy Spirit, who, and again, it's just, it's not a competition. It's not like Satan's like as powerful as Jesus. So I'd rather focus on the glory of God than the diminished once glory of the fallen angel, Trying Lucifer. Trying to use trickery and these little parlor tricks when... They know they're on the losing team. Uh, you segued very well into question two. Um, someone mentioned that you said on Sunday that God and Satan are not equals. Can you explain more about that? Yeah, and the reason this is so important is because so many people in our culture have bought into Eastern worldview religion. And what I mean by that is that kind of this Hindu, Buddhist, and, and I'm, I know I'm lumping a lot of stuff in when I say Eastern philosophy um, or even New Age religion, um, but it's this idea of yin and yang, and there's got to be an equal balance. And again, ironically, that's where George Lucas got his concept for the, the balance of the force from Star Wars, from studying the Hebrew and Buddhist Buddhist. Uh, uh, worldviews that you know there has to be an equal um, and I was talking with someone just a couple months ago who couldn't grasp the magnitude of who God was because he, he kept elevating Satan his head his head because again he, he didn't know the Bible well but in his worldview good and bad had to be equal uh, and finally when I said to him you do realize that Satan is a fallen angel like he's not a deity He's like comparable to Michael and to Gabriel and one of the other Ninja Turtles, right? Oh. So he's not really a deity. He's a fallen angel. So he's not equal with God alone. And again, the story in, in Mark 5 with demon, the demon legion, the man with an army of demons in him is what he says, taking on Jesus. The, the whole story builds up for this massive showdown. And then it doesn't happen. Why? Because there is no power. There is nothing that compares to God. What do we see? Instead of this massive showdown, because it, the, the passage builds up where nobody could contain this man. He breaks chains. People are scared of him. He breaks leg irons. I mean, he's superhuman. He's like a superman. And Jesus shows up. And if you're in the audience, you're like, holy cow, it's Jesus versus he's an army. Win. And it's a big deal, right? And we're all like ready for the, the major event. And the demon goes, uh, I know I'm not going to win. I'm not even going to try. Can I go into the pigs? And the demons are like begging Jesus to go into the pigs because it's not equal. They're not equal. An army of demons is not equal to one Jesus. And I, that's so comforting for our lives. Amen. Like when you talk about should we be scared of demons? Listen, an army of demons is not equal to Jesus. An army of demons is not equal to Jesus. They're begging to go into the pigs rather than take on Jesus. I loved the imagery you shared yesterday of Jesus stopping there where he did, crossing that lake, river, right. ocean, I don't know, lake. <laughs> the ocean. <laughs> Wow. My geography, wife, uh, geography. geography is not my thing. Um, <laughs> After he crossed the Atlantic Ocean, it was... <laughs> thought maybe it was the Indian. Anywho, um, just for that man, just to cast the demons out of that man and save that one man, and just the imagery of here comes Jesus for me. Oh, I loved it. Loved it. Um, the last two I'm going to kind of combine... Um, Again, we're seeing a lot of the fear of, of the demons and their power, but um, someone asked, how can I be sure a demon won't get inside me? Um, and then if you want to just kind of take that one into how do we know if we're under attack or if um, things are just going bad? Yeah, let me answer the second one first because that one's a bit more tricky. And 
so I've literally had people call me like, I think there's a demon in my car. Oh. And I'm like, oh? And they're like, yeah. And they start telling me all the things that go wrong and it's constantly broke down. And, you know, then you find out their car is like from 1912. And, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it might be just you driving an old car. Maybe that's what's going on. And you don't take care of it. And, and so there, there is like, hey, just bad things happen, right? Every bad thing is not to be attributed to Satan. Life's tough, right? And so Satan isn't always out to get you. The reason you lost your job isn't because of Satan. It's because you didn't show up at work on time for three weeks straight, right? So don't blame that on Satan. The, the reason you got hooked on drugs isn't because Satan was out there shoving them into your arm. It's because he was tempting you. But then you you didn't run away from the temptation. Uh, the reason you know you got pregnant as a teenager isn't because Satan was like attacking you. It's because you decided to have premarital sex. So again, often we give Satan more power than he has. And and C.S. Lewis again, great uh, thinker, reminds us that that's one of the dangers that sometimes we think Satan's in everything. You know, he's everywhere. He's got all this power, and and he really doesn't. Uh, the other side of it is, is he also says, but don't think that he's not there. Don't think that we're not in the war still. Uh, so he says, you know, kind of stay in the middle. Um, and so is Satan attacking you every day? Is, how do we know when we're under attack? Um, I would, first of all, if, if I were questioning whether or not I was under attack, I would take it to some godly wise friends uh, people that are smarter than you about the supernatural, people who have a discerning spirit. Um, and I would tell them the stories. Like, this is why I think this. This is why I wonder. Um, and then again, remember, you can pray against the demonic forces, whether they're happening or not. You don't have to be like, no, I know for sure. Like, I was watching and that, that candle over there moved without anybody touching it. Uh, you can pray long before then for God's protection and God's intervention and God surrounding your family and your house. And all those are prayers that are modeled within Scripture. Um, so there's no like, hey, if you hang a paper on the wall and it you know, flips over in the middle of the night and turns black, that's how you know the saint's attacking you. There's no like, this is the test. Um, and, but again, don't give Satan any more power than he has, but don't ignore him either. Uh, so the, the the second question then, what was it again? How can we be sure that a demon won't get inside? Yeah, this one's really important because, uh, again, I think this comes more from movies than it does from any understanding of biblical context. Uh, so they come to Jesus and they, they say, hey, what does demon out? Jesus casts the demon out. And then he says to the man, like, Hey, change your ways or else what may come back to this house will be worse than what I just cast out. Now, I'm paraphrasing Jesus just a bit. And the point is, is that everybody is a temple of God. And so a house of God. This scripture uses us as images of temple of God. Remember in the Old Testament, the temple or the tabernacle is where the Spirit of God came down and it dwelt in. And, and, and when the Holy Spirit comes down, it dwells in us. And so there's this idea in Scripture that's used all through the Old Testament and the New Testament that we are mobile temples of God. In that, is your temple of God dedicated to Satan or is it dedicated to God? And one, one of those two is going to take up residence. And so this is where I say to my atheist friends, I, I mean, I don't say to them, you know, you're actually filled with saying, but uh, that wouldn't go so well. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, this is where I get really nervous for them because while they don't think that, you know, they think they're free, they think that, that their house, they're in control, the reality of it is, is they've already opened the door. And again, a lot of my atheistic friends don't like to hear logic about God, don't want to study God. In fact, I, I have one friend who tells me anytime we get too serious about God, he just gets like very upset on the inside. Mm -hmm. And I just, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, it's because there's a demon living in you, but he doesn't want to let you know there's a demon living in you because you might do something about that because you just have been speaking to someone who will say, be gone, demon, in the power of Jesus, right? Uh, so how can you be sure you don't get a demon in you is make sure God owns your house. Mm -hmm. 
right? And if Jesus owns your house, you are a disciple of Christ, you don't have to be worried like in the middle of the night, a demon's going to come in and take over. When Jesus owns your house, when Jesus is your king, all right, Satan cannot come inside you. You cannot be possessed, all right? What, what God has in his hand, Satan cannot snatch, snatch away. The only way for us to get out of God's hand is to ask God to be released from his hand. God will never, ever, ever let you go in the sense of you just can't be taken from him because once you are his, you are his. But if you ask to be removed from God's hand, God doesn't force you to stay in that relationship with him then you are now vulnerable to attack. You have a big sign out on your chest. You just can't read it. And it says vacancy and anyone who wants to come in. Uh, so that that's the, the long answer to the question. But again, just give your life to Jesus. You don't need to worry about it. Now, let me throw a caveat in there. Here's what Satan's going to say to you. Give your life to Jesus. If he's a good God, things will go better for you and your life will be easy. Ha! Ah! Yeah, that's not what God promises at all. In fact, Jesus says, come follow me. It's going to get harder, right? Why? Because now you're under attack. Before you weren't under attack, and God doesn't attack. Uh, and so once you follow Jesus, you will be under attack at times. Um, so so that's the short answer. That's the long answer. I think we got through them all, which I didn't think we would. Anything you want to add to that? Um, I don't think so. Just you talking about um, how do I know a, a demon? How can I be sure a demon won't get inside me? I mean, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Right. And they're, they're not going to share that space. Right. Uh, and if they did, look out, demon. Right. So a quote from Taylor University from the dorm that I lived in, Sammy Morris, who was a refugee. And he's got a great story. You should check out the story of Sammy Morris. Uh, but I loved his quote. It was on... Uh, a fountain that we had outside of our hall and it said where the spirit of god abides filth cannot mm. where the spirit of god abides filth cannot so that's lovely it's a good thing to close with it is yeah all right so yeah uh, if you're up to date with us you're not watching this like two or three weeks after we've done it uh nathan coach shiv is preaching tomorrow uh, tomorrow sunday at the church uh sarah and i'll be out of town we're celebrating her birthday and so we're excited about that and we have a couple big things coming up we have our first young adult meeting yes. uh october 25th and uh so you want to keep an eye out for that and then we have the the Second campus launch at Xenia. Got like a preview coming up, right? Right, we have a preview this Sunday at uh, six thirty. But the second campus launch is November first, and then those of you that are attending or plan on attending the Fairborn campus, the time moves up to nine thirty. Sarah is actually wow. She's excited because she's like, I'm going to go to the first service, and then I'm coming home and taking a nap, and none accurate. of you will be here to bother me. <laughs> that is so true. she's pumped about that. So. <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, keep sending us your questions. Great questions tonight. Uh, we love answering them. We love. We, we, we have a lot of fun doing these. So thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, please click like, share, follow us, all those things. Have a great night, guys. Goodbye. Bye.